Since we are now in module 5, you should have the drill down pretty well. Let's look at this module's patients and their presentations. The first comes to your office with GIT infection and has recently ate at a street food vendor's. He suspects the chicken from his burrito was undercooked. What is the disease most likely to be seen? This type of gastritis is likely to show positive for blood on rectal exam. Make sure to list out all the other bacteria that create hemorrhagic bowel diseases. This one's interesting. The patient has cutaneous rose-looking macules, constipation, is febrile, and complains that their stomach hurts. Typhoid fever is a rare presentation these days, but makes for an interesting description. The rose spots are caused by bacteria causing emboli into the superficial blood vessels. Another patient comes in with a history of sickle cell disease. We also get a report back from the lab that salmonella was cultured. What is the most likely cause of their bone pain? Sickle cell may devitalize bone blood flow and allow it to be colonized by certain bacteria in the bloodstream. For whatever reason, salmonella is more common for osteomyelitis in these high-risk patients than many other bugs. Although E. coli can cause a wide range of disease states, let's focus on the most common for now. The first one is more common in the female patient due to anatomy. If you know nothing else, what is your guess about this disease, and what E. coli subspecies is responsible? E. tech, or enterotoxigenic E. coli, is most likely the cause of this female patient's UTI. Any bacterium that is normal gut flora can become problematic if it enters the GU tract. A child is brought in by their parents with typical sick syndromes of fever and vomiting. They recently went to a family outing to a fast food burger joint. What is the cause of this child's vomiting, and what is the severe form of this disease? E. heck causes hemorrhagic gastritis, which can lead to kidney failure. This uremic syndrome is associated with a shiga toxin produced by several enteric bacteria. The title Montezuma's Revenge has been given to certain presentations of gastritis. It is often transmitted by infected water sources in developing nations. What is this presentation called? Also known as traveler's diarrhea, e tech is the cause of this watery diarrhea. The next gut-wrenching bug is Shigella. So we already know there are a few interesting diseases this one causes. This first patient has severe diarrhea, tenismus, and nausea. You can add this shigellosis disease to the hemorrhagic gastritis list. When people speak of dysentery, this is often the bacteria that they're talking about. Another commonality we see in Shigella and Campylobacter is the post-infection complications. In particular, this patient will have trouble using their hands and feet, and it hurts when they pee. The post-infection sequela of reactive arthritis is one of the popular test questions. They can't see, can't pee, and can't climb a tree. We simply left out the trifecta of conjunctivitis in this patient. Lastly, our patient complains of stomach pain and or diarrhea. In the clinic room, they begin to seize. What is the cause if we already have diagnosed Shigella? This rare presentation of toxic encephalopathy can be caused by brain swelling. In the U.S., bacterial encephalopathy can occur rarely and is more commonly seen in children. Still, you would want to rule out all other toxins in an encephalopathic patient as well, since this would probably not be on the top of your list. You're in the clinic typing away patient's note when you get a phone call. There's been an outbreak of diarrhea at a local daycare. They are sure it's bacteria and not the more common viral pathogens and ask you what to do next. Which bacteria in this genus is the likely culprit? Though not as common as rotavirus and other viral causes, why enterocolitica is a common cause of daycare illness? The next likely question on the phone call will be regarding treatment options, so you might want to pay attention to the upcoming tier. Next, we have chest pain, cough, and excessive speed of production. We can see this is a respiratory infection, and our first bug for these is usually strep pneumo. But this patient is an archaeologist that recently uncovered a sealed cooking jar from London circa 1300s. Unlike Indiana Jones, this archaeologist can't seem to escape the dangers of his job and opens a sealed jar and inhaled plague bacteria. Though comical, this example demonstrates how demographics and occupational information can be helpful in the differential diagnosis. The next patient has enlarged lymph nodes and patches of necrotic skin. He is homeless and lives under a bridge where there are many rats roaming around. Unfortunately, this poor patient has been bitten by fleas, and these bites have injected him with Y. pestis. When on the skin, this bacteria can cause skin necrosis and gangrene. 
the lymph node swelling is a great way to separate this out from other skin pathologies, such as anthrax. A child comes to the doctor's office holding his stomach in pain. On examination, palpating the belly causes the child to wince and cry out. The child's labs come back positive for Y. pestis. What is this presentation called? This kid has many symptoms similar to appendicitis and is the proper age range for this disease. Pseudoappendicitis is rare, and a question stem may be more likely to give you an older patient to help differentiate. Needless to say, there will be more clues in a question to help separate this out, as presentation alone is not enough. On to Klebsiella and its many anatomic regions of infection. First, a patient is coughing up currant jelly and frothy sputum into a handkerchief. On reviewing their chart, you also see a history of substance abuse disorder for ETOH. What disease are you considering at this point? If a question stem doesn't give you direct testing that would single out Klebsiella for an ammonia case, the current jelly sputum is sometimes a popular buzzword. Next, a patient describes a recent development of pelvic pain and nausea and vomiting. Her temperature is 104 Fahrenheit taken at home. If we have diagnosed the pathogen of concern, what disease does this presentation follow? Though not one of the more common causes of UTI, Klebsiella can infect the urogenital tract as well. Another clue was that this was a female patient, which has a higher incidence for this disease. UTI typically doesn't have a fever, so in reality, we'd be more concerned with the more severe sequela of pyelonephritis at this point. Our last patient for this microbe shows up complaining of genital ulcers that have developed days ago. They do not hurt, but seem to be growing in size. If it is a painless genital lesion, we can eliminate H. ducreae right off the back and some viral infections like herpes. Painless lesions are more likely to be from Klebsiella or Treponema syphilis. In Klebsiella, the disease is also called granuloma inguinale, as it is caused in these inguinal regions. We also had a list of miscellaneous bacteria at the end of the first tier video. Can you recall these? They're much lower yield, but let's knock out a few possible questions here as well. A favorite on surgical related test questions revolves around stab or gun wounds to the abdomen causing infection and possible sepsis. Which is the most likely involved in this of the named bacteria? Bacteroides is an anaerobic bacteria that can be a post-trauma concern. It will lead to abscess creation in the affected tissues. Try to recall specialized treatments for anaerobic bacteria. Next, a patient states that her right side is exquisitely tender. On ultrasound, we see an abnormality involving the right kidney. The bacteria is also one of the urease positive bugs mentioned in this module. Here is a fairly common presentation for kidney stones. Proteus is known to cause a particular stone called a struvite stone due to urease activity. And finally, the last patient does not have a fever but complains of dysuria and urinary frequency. While well, all of the bugs mentioned in this last section can cause UTI, recall that without a fever, it is most likely a UTI, and with, it is most concerning for pyelonephritis. So far, we have begun to add in some differential diagnosis critical thinking skills slowly. This requires you to think back to microbes from other modules to compare and contrast similar diseases and presentations. This will be revisited in the treatment tier, where we have a little more time and will need to not only differentiate between the bugs of concern, but also their treatment options.